I've titled this lecture, Pythagoras and the Divinity of Number, and I do so to put into quite vivid contrast a transcendentalist or abstract philosophy and the naturalistic philosophy that is going to become rather more common in Hellenic philosophy at large and, of course, central in the philosophy of Aristotle. Pythagoras is a figure shrouded in mystery but the subject of relentless lore. Both ancient and modern, he is one of the towering figures in the history of ideas. This, we are told, having been predicted by none other than the Oracle at Delphi. It is said that when the Oracle was consulted by Pythagoras's parents-to-be, by his wealthy merchant father, Nesarchus, and mother, Parthenus, they were told their son would surpass all men in wisdom. Well, on their way back to Samos, their son was born in Sidon, we are told, and would amaze many from the first. Pythagoras spent many of his early years traveling. His Egyptian travels lasted for a period of years as he became well acquainted with the technical achievements of the Egyptian civilization. These included advances in what today we would call applied mathematics. The Egyptians had worked out techniques for calculating acreage, for example, a kind of planimetric mathematics in which you could tell how large fields were even though very uneven in shape and distribution. The so-called Rhind and Moscow papyri, dating from about 1700 BC, contained some 112 mathematical problems, mostly practical, but a few being of an abstract nature. In one, the Egyptian student must determine how to divide various numbers of loaves of bread to give equal shares to various numbers of persons, all this requiring the use of fractions. And as early as 2000 BC, the Egyptians had a calendar with a 365-day year and the means by which to predict the flooding of the Nile. Thus, Pythagoras had much to learn from this ancient people. There is less evidence about his time in India. On one account, the invasion of Egypt by Cambyses resulted in Pythagoras being sent to Babylon as a prisoner, there studying with the Magi and learning their secret crafts and rituals. There are sources that claim he not only studied in India but became famous as a teacher there where he was, it is said, known as, quote, the Ionian teacher. We do know that in that same period in the 6th century, the great religious figure Jinnah surfaces in India. Jinnah had come from a very well-to-do family. However, his mother and father, it is said, starved themselves to death in old age. That is, they adopted an extreme asceticism in life and carried it to its spiritual conclusion at the end, now finally and fully abandoning the materiality of earthly life. Pythagoras was surely taken by this. He was, I suppose, in his early thirties at the time. He would come to devote his own life to ascetic teaching and thereby absorb himself into the great cosmic order of things. Perhaps through the teachings of the ascetics, Pythagoras accepted that every living thing has the same class membership, the same familial membership. With so many of his contemporaries, and as part of Hindu belief, he believed in the transmigration of souls, the fact that at death something in us is liberated. I mentioned Atman in the earlier lecture. Something in us is liberated and is able to reclaim its transcendent life, as it were. And as his teachings consistently oppose all forms of destruction, all forms of intentionally caused death to any living animal, we see this surfacing in his philosophy. This is his vegetarianism with a passion. His followers would take to walking down the streets. The Jains of India do this to this day with brooms to sweep out of the way insects they otherwise might step on. Today's Jains consume liquids through a filter lest some small organism enter into their body and be destroyed. Jainism is a great ethical school exemplary for the celebration of life as such. 
Of Pythagoras, writing some eight centuries uh, later, Iamblichus would say that, quote, he unfolded the friendship of all things toward all, so that even now those who are benevolent in the extreme are called Pythagoreans. On some accounts, Pythagoras spent nearly 40 of his first 56 years in distant lands, finally returning to the Greek-speaking colonies. At this point, he has a cult or sect forming around him, committed to his teaching. Nonetheless, he is a politically active person. He becomes for a short period of time the governor of Crotona, then a Greek settlement in Italy. It's a settlement that is almost constantly at odds and sometimes in open war with Sybaris, which hosts those people whose form of life and conduct comes down to us in the form of the word Sybarite. In Sybaris we find youth all decked out in finery. They are all powdered in purple tunics, their sandals of the best sort. They make themselves up and they are bejeweled, believe it or not, some of them actually wear earrings. Whereas in Crotona, under the tutelage and directorship of the ascetic Pythagoras, we find a sect of contemplative people, paying little attention to the needs of the body, to the day-to-day -day and mundane affairs of their own materiality and material life, and committed instead to the deepest and most sustained inquiry into the ultimate nature of things. Of course, an old school of philosophy before Socrates is, among the pre-Socratic schools, the school of philosophy known as the Cynics. And one of the leading Cynics was Diogenes. I just offer you this as perhaps a, an apocryphal story, but it's a per, it, it, it is perfect for Diogenes. It is said that when Diogenes would attend theater in Athens, when the Sybarites, the young men of Sybaris, came in all decked out and perfumed, walking past Diogenes to take their seats in the theater, Diogenes would lean back and say as they walked by in the Greek, affectation. And then some minutes later, the Crotonian youngsters would come in, their tattered sandals and shabby tunics, their hair unkempt. And as they would walk by, Diogenes would say, more affectation. In this recording that almost constant theme in Hellenic thought, nothing to excess. I wish at this point to juxtapose the Pythagorean attention to transcendental and abstract considerations against the naturalistic perspective that is so dominant in Aristotle and in ancient Greek medicine and science. This is important for two reasons. First, Pythagoras is an important source or forerunner for what we will come to understand to be Platonic thought, or at least one phase of Platonic thought. The most economical way to pick up on this is within the context of Pythagoreanism, that reality as we know it is created out of something that is itself not material, but is architectonic for all that can be material, something that is the abstract plan, the abstract idea on which reality is constructed. And that abstract idea ultimately is, alas, number. Hence, the divinity of number, the creative power of number itself, the creative power of the cosmic soul, the ultimate creative force in the universe. It is through number that the material and physical reality all around us becomes accessible to the senses. The Pythagoreans placed great stress on the first four positive integers in the Greek, the sum of them yielding, uh, referred to as the te tetractus in the Greek, the sum of the first four yielding ten. One, two, three, four. Just four positive integers. Now what are they going to do with this? One, two, three, four. Ah, well, what is one? One is a point. That is, the abstract character of the number one is the basis upon which there can be a point. Two? Two constitutes the basis upon which there can be a line, the bridge between two points. Three constitutes the abstract primordium of the plane, and four, the abstract grounding of the solid of the tetrahedron, which always had a special place 
in Pythagorean teaching. So the cosmic soul makes use of number to fabricate a material reality and needs very little with which to do this. And of course, as you arrange the one, two, three, four, the sum is ten. The number ten takes on a very special value in Pythagorean thought and teaching as well. Now when I say the divinity of number, I'm referring to something that is not quantitative as such. One, two, three, and four are not mere integers. Pythagoras is probably best known to students today for the theorem a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And many also understand Pythagoras, who was the first to call himself a philosopher, as the one who discovered the musical scale and musical harmonies, the arithmetic, or shall we say the mathematical principles of harmony. Now there is some controversy as to whether Pythagoras actually discovered this, but certainly the Pythagorean school was known for it, and Pythagoras himself was credited with it. Now just as for Pythagoras, one, two, three, and four are not mere numbers, neither can it be a coincidence that the harmonic structure of music should have as its reliable effect on our auditory system, that is, that we should hear as harmonious what in fact is governed by the mathematical laws of harmony. Why is it that the perfect fifth sounds the way it does? Why is it that right up to and throughout much of the medieval period, moving from C to F sharp was actually considered a sinful maneuver. It wasn't simply, something simply discordant. It was something that violated what is profoundly important, something violative of a harmonic precept, thought to be part of the intended design and order of the cosmos. This proved to be an understanding that spanned centuries. Now what's underneath all this? It's the view that creation is itself an expression of an essentially harmonic and mathematical structure, expressive of a divinely rational plan. It is in the relational, it is in the rational relationships between and among abstract entities that the lawfulness of the cosmos itself comes about and the lawfulness of our own bodily processes will come about and the lawfulness with which we might enter into social and civic life. Number is at the bottom of it all. The reason why chords are harmonious is because we are constituted in such a way as to resonate with certain combinations of numbers and to find discordant other combinations. The Pythagoreans thought that there was an ultimate truth here, grounding all other truths. Well, predictably, Pythagorean medical therapy included music centrally. Disorders at a, at a certain superficial level are corporeal disorders. Smith has indigestion or facial tics or drags his left leg behind him. Well, that's at the level of the body. But of course, the body is just the material manifestation of something that is itself and ultimately and fundamentally not material. Well, if it isn't material, what is it? It is relational. Now how should this be understood? Well, let's be guided by geometry as we learned it in school. What is a rectilinear triangle anyway? When we are told that a right angle triangle, like all triangles, contains 180 degrees, one of these angles being 90 degrees, how does one know that? Now you might say you take out some sort of measuring instrument and draw a right angle triangle with it, making sure that you've got two acute angles and that one angle is 90 degrees. The problem is, you'll never do it. Try as you may, you'll never do it. You might humor yourself into thinking that you've done it. In fact, if your measuring instruments are crude enough, you'll be absolutely satisfied that you've done it. But the better and better the measuring instrument, the more obvious it is that you did not hit 90 degrees plus or minus nothing. And certainly anything you draw is an utterly impermanent thing. Put it on a blackboard and ultimately as planet Earth suffers the heat death there will be no blackboards, there will be none of us, there will be no classrooms or textbooks or anything, but there will be rectilinear triangles. Oh, they won't be drawn rectilinear triangles. They won't be chalk on slate. 
what will they be? They will be the eternal, immutable relationship a square plus b square equals c square. What a rectilinear triangle is, is that which answers to, answers to the Pythagorean theorem. It is not something material or physical, but a formal relationship, abstractly conceived. Now just as the harmonic musical scale matches up with something in the soul with which it resonates, so the rectilinear triangle, as given by the Pythagorean theorem, certainly matches up with what? Well, it matches up with uh, three-sided figures that have one angle of 90 degrees. There is this wonderful correspondence, not perfect, mind you, but a most useful and remarkable correspondence between the realm of mathematical abstraction and that realm of material reality so accurately described and fashioned by way of these mathematical abstractions. This is a feature of reality that continues to excite and perplex. Ask yourself this question. There have been mathematical discoveries at the level of pure abstraction that predate by decades and sometimes by centuries what science with technical advances comes to discover to be the case in the actual universe. That is, the mathematics predates by decades or even centuries an actual physical reality. It actually describes, it lays out the central characteristics with great precision of something actually found in the universe or in the shell of the conch or in the snowflake. How is it that abstract mathematics, initially utterly uninterested in the things of this world, nonetheless ends up providing the best most accurate, most precise, and most revealing characterization of the things of this world. You can actually generate things of this world starting off with a mathematical equation, whose discoverer was simply thinking, well now what are we inclined to say is, my goodness what a happy coincidence this is, isn't it just remarkable that every now and then some sort of furrow-browed mathematician comes out of a room, takes the green shades off, coughs a bit and says, I've got this multi-term equation here, it doesn't match up with anything, it's entirely meaningless at the level of daily experience, came to me in a dream, and by the way, I'm going to die now. And then he keels over. And then 175 years later, someone studying arachnids, or platyhelminthes, or some distant galaxy, or quarks, or something else says, Goodness gracious, we actually have an equation that describes this. How is it that basic mathematical equations describe everything physics knows about the physical world? How is it that the cosmos is regulated? I'm using regulated within quotation marks. That the cosmos is, as it were, dictated to, it is authorized, as it were, by differential equations, which had nothing to do with this at the outset. Well, let me not get too excited by this, but I do think it's one of the exciting moments in the history of thought when we discover that something at the level of pure and abstract mathematical thought corresponds almost perfectly, hip and thigh, chapter and verse, to the nth place after the decimal with some brute material fact of creation. Pythagoras was not a man who thought that such connections were accidental or coincidental. He was prepared in a philosophically reflective way to test the implications of that kind of agreement, and he was satisfied that the result of the test led inevitably to an essentially transcendentalist and abstract view as regards the foundation of all that there is. If we take the creative force behind all existing things to be a divine force, then we can only conclude that number is a kind of divinity. That number, in its abstract, transcendental nature, is divine. Then, too, there are numbers that will not and cannot match up with anything material or perceptible. Consider the transcendental number pi or the square root of minus 1, or e. 
Mathematicians have a whole host of such constructs for which there are no physical analogs. Nonetheless, to calculate the circumference of a circle, you must use pi. And still other practical problems require the incorporation of still other irrational transcendental numbers. Now, for the Pythagoreans, coincidence cannot account for this. Pythagoras died long before probability theory, which is largely a 17th and 18th century invention. But he, as we, certainly could claim an intuitive sense of what might be called long shots or long odds. Now, what do you think the probability would be that someone speculating abstractly in the domain of mathematics would come up with a complex equation which two or three hundred years later would perfectly describe some brute physical fact available, accessible to the senses. The question answers itself. And as such occurrences exceed chance expectations or the work of accident, they must express some sort of plan. The ultimate plan must itself be abstract, but capable of generating the physical reality, experienced at the perceptible level. And the abstract plan is a plan of relationship, because the salient facts of the physical world are the relational features that make things what they are. What is the harmonic scale except relationships among sounds? You can recognize a familiar melody played in any key. Yet, as you move from key to key, the actual frequency of the notes changes. So what creates the melody is not the frequency of the separate notes, it's not the physics of the sound, it's the relationship among the participating elements. Some of them work perfectly. Some of them are highly discordant. The ones that work perfectly match up with something in us that is comparably tuned, something that is itself expressive of a relational principle, finally a rational principle. And that's the, the thesis on which any philosophy worth having must be erected. And that is the Pythagorean bequest. That's the debt Plato owes to Pythagoras. Well, what sort of governor was he? I told you something about how his followers and disciples showed up for the theater. I've always thought, when I read these accounts, and they tend to be rather late accounts, but I've always thought it was quite remarkable that they went to the theater at all. Well, what kind of governor was Pythagoras? The people finally staged riots and rebellions and drove the Pythagoreans from Crotona. That old-time religion wasn't wearing very well as the 6th century BC moved inexorably toward the 5th century BC. But how was it that Pythagoras could be found to be a man of affairs at all? I mean, is this sort of thing uh, something philosophers do? Do, do? do you know that a little later on Socrates is going to be arguing that there will be nothing but strife and misery within the polis until philosophers become kings and kings philosophers? Well, I wonder what Socrates would have had to say if someone had said, well, what sort of a job did Pythagoras do in that regard? And uh, here I think it is important to point out that you can't judge the philosophical dimensions of a body of knowledge in terms of how it works practically in the political arena. This will become clearer as Plato and especially Aristotle start making distinctions between custom, man-made law, and the laws that we regard as the laws of the physical universe. The difference between nature, as in physis, nomos, as in custom, nomos, as in legislated custom. As Aristotle will teach, we seek precision only in so far as the subject allows it. And there is not to be a Pythagorean theorem for political life. So the answer to the question, how did Crotona fare under the guidance of Pythagoras and his followers? Ah, I think the right answer to the question is, not too well at all. And it's not quite clear that a philosophically guided state is likely to survive the reality in which it finds itself. Now what about the sense in which Pythagoras um, as it were, arrogated to himself the title of first philosopher. He may well have been. The ancients declare that he was the first one to call himself a philosopher. I say, arrogate to himself. Did he make the claim arrogantly as in, 
I am a philosopher and you're not. Well, what is a philosopher? It's someone who loves something. It's someone who has befriended something. Do you see? Philos, philia. Aristotle will tell us later on that the property the law has that attracts us to it is a kind of friendliness toward us, the Greek word here being philikon. Philadelphia, philos, sophos, sophia. Sophia is wisdom. Now the Greeks had several words for what we try to get at with notions of intelligence or knowledge. A scientific knowledge, which is the knowledge of, shall we say, the causal principles that govern things, was covered by the word episteme. The practical knowledge by which one deals with day-to-day -day affairs and makes prudential and correct choices consistent with the right kind of life is covered by the word phronesis. But Sophia is something else. Sophia is what the wise person possesses. The one in possession of Sophia is the one you consult when you're finally taking yourself seriously enough to ask core questions about the meaning of life, the ultimate point and purpose of things. Pythagoras, non-arrogantly, and I think quite aptly, called himself a philosopher because he had devoted himself to an inquiry serving the purposes of wisdom itself. He wanted to know the truth of things, not so that, but because he had befriended wisdom itself. He saw the realization of his own humanity as inextricably bound up with a form of life that was a critical and inquiring form of life. He understood that he could only come to know the kind of being he was by coming to know what it is that makes anything possible and real. Now, of course, we can dispute into the late hours whether what makes anything possible is ultimately and fundamentally number. But consider the periodic table on which uh, modern chemistry depends. Surely the relationships that uh, obtain among the chemical constituents of the world are expressed in terms of numerical relationships, numerical powers that come about as a result of numbers of electrons and bonding forces and the like. So one might say that to the extent that things really existing are chemical things, well, we might not want to say that they are made possible by number, but we would surely say that the most accurate description of what they are is going to be fundamentally numerical. Then there are those in particle physics who will say that it is ultimately quarks held together by gluons that constitute reality. That is to say, what makes reality possible is there are quarks and there are gluons holding quarks together. Now what is it that allows a gluon to hold together a quark? And what combination must, and what combination um, of gluons would be necessary to hold quarks together in order for there to be a cosmos, or a sailboat, or a cuttlefish? And when we ask a question like this, we're likely to be regaled uh, with a series of, ready, equations. And if we press on to ask, why one theoretical account is judged to be superior to alternatives, we're likely to be told that it's because the theory matches up with, of all things, a set of equations, a set of numerical relations. In fact, one of the characteristic features of scientific theories that enjoy uh, a great reception and popularity within the advanced reaches of theoretical physics is the property of elegance and simplicity, where elegance and simplicity are themselves uh, expressed in terms of mathematical precision, mathematical, formulaic simplicity. So here again we see that uh, on this uh, very difficult question of what the necessary conditions are for anything to come into being, even the greatest advances in contemporary physics do take a very strong position behind number as such. Numerousness, uh, a, a kind of informed numerology. Well, ah yes, the divinity of number. But now with the divinity removed, at least for a time.